There's more people on this side than this side. That's used. That's new. <laughs> it is good to be here with you all this morning. Um, today's Holy Trinity Sunday, which is the only Sunday in the church year that's dedicated to doctrine, as in teachings. And um, so we think of, you know, we know the Holy Trinity as the Father, Son, Holy Spirit our Creator and Redeemer and Holy Spirit. Um, some of us have historically understood the Trinity 
only in, in, in male terms just because of our language is very masculine in that way, but the Holy Trinity is male and female, and, and that's good to hold on to. And so sometimes people re, will refer to the Holy Spirit as she, but um, it's just important to think about the fact that when we think of God, the invitation is to not think man. And especially when we look at the creation story, um, the seeds of the Holy Trinity as three and one are right there at the very beginning when God said, let us make humans in our image, like we, male and female, we will make them. And so that means, I didn't quote that perfectly, but that's the gist of it. But So that means that we are only reflective of God as the image of God in male and female. And I think that that's an important lesson to hold on to. That's not part of my sermon, so you got my little mini sermon before we start. <laughs> um, and now we will start with um, a prayer of confession and forgiveness. And I invite you, if you want to, we're going to try and change our language. Linda and I learned some, and Scott and I learned some things about accessibility language and things like that at Senate Assembly this week. So if you would like to stand, please stand, but it's not required. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned. We have hurt our community. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and you are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We join in singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. <laughs> Thank you. 
us pray. God of heaven and earth, before the foundation of the universe and the beginning of time, you are the triune God, author of creation, eternal word of salvation, life-giving spirit of wisdom. Guide us to all truth by your spirit, that we may pro proclaim all that Christ has revealed and rejoice in the glory Christ shares with us. Glory and praise to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm a pitch reader. I'm, 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 what's that called? A relief reader. Relief reader. Uh, the uh, first reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Paul writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Matthew in the 28th chapter. Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord God, as we reflect on your word here and outside these walls, help us to remember that promise that you are with us all the way to the end. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as the church year goes, this story would have happened before Pentecost that we celebrated last week. So, um, it's a good reminder, though, that matters of faith aren't necessarily chronological. And so we, we can hold on to that just in how we, how we read our scripture. But I love this story, this little snippet, of the disciples encountering Jesus, the 11 remaining disciples. I especially love 
that the author of this gospel admitted that some of the disciples doubted. Now, some people will use this text to help authenticate the Gospels, the Gospel stories, because they'll say, well, you know, if they were just making it up, they wouldn't have admitted that there was doubt. It's actually a pretty good argument, right? Because if you're going to make a story about starting your new religion, you're not going to throw in, well, half of what's thrown in here. Like, they doubted, or Peter sunk, or the disciples all fell asleep while Jesus was in the garden. The disciples, we might look at them as like, look at these people, they did such great things. They were human beings, just like us. And they made mistakes, just like us. They struggled, just like us. And they had their doubts. And I think that that is okay. And in fact, I think doubt, having doubt is more healthy than being absolutely certain. Because when you're absolutely certain that this is white and this is black and there's a dividing line right between the two, you don't really have room for growth. When you're absolutely certain of something, it's really hard for somebody to introduce new ideas to you. So I think that doubt in this context is right there alongside faith. And it's not something that Jesus condemns. Did Jesus say anything to them about their doubt? Did he say, you got to believe if you're going to be worthy? He didn't say that. He didn't say, he does, you know, in other contexts, why do you have such little faith? What did he do in the face of that some doubted? He gave them a job to do. He gave what we refer to today as the Great Commission. It's like the biggest job any of us could have as people of faith. And that is to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. That's how we make disciples. We baptize and we teach. But we can't do that unless we are disciples, right? It's kind of circular. And to be disciples, we need to forever be learning everything that Jesus commanded or to do. I remember I used to ha say this with the, the kids, like if you someone's going to teach, then there have to be people that want to learn. <laughs> Otherwise, who are you teaching? Well, we could maybe teach ourselves a thing or two sometimes. But all of us are invited to be on a journey of learning. Specifically, on learning how to obey all that Jesus commanded. And for the next few months, we'll be in Matthew's gospel, and we'll be scratching our head a few times at how hard it is to always obey everything that Jesus commanded. But again, we can, we, can, um, we can summarize those commands into love God and love neighbor. And then I think of all of that Jesus taught is commentary on how you do that. But 
for them and for us and for everybody in between, part about an important part about being a disciple is learning to see things differently. Learning how to love God. Learning how to love neighbor in the context of our time. Some people like to say, well, God's word never changes. And yeah, we could say that's true, but our context changes all the time. And so how we understand what God is teaching us sometimes changes. I, um, I shared with Jan and Doug this morning, and I think I've told you all this a few times before, but Pastor Al, my former pastor at Trinity, used to always say that you have to be very humble in what you think you know, because in 100 years, people will look back at us and say, what were they thinking? Just like we look back on people in history and our superiority and say, what were they thinking? We always have invitations to change our minds. Especially as that invitation is wrapped around God's call, Jesus' command, the Holy Spirit's empowering to love neighbor. So I have three examples of how we're, we're in the midst of, some, in some ways, learning to change the way we see our world in response to God's call. The first is, you know, we, keep, we invite you all the time to do book study with us on um, us as a congregation tackling racism, trying to be better leaders in our world. And so we're, we just finished this morning talking about this book called Wired for Racism. And we kept looking forward to chapter five because they said something earlier, like we got the idea that chapter five was gonna like be the best chapter. And so we're like, oh, I can't wait to get to chapter five because chapter one is hard and two is hard and three is hard. And I read chapter 5, and I'm like, well, there is no magic bullet in chapter 5. But that's the point, isn't it? Because there's no magic bullet in learning how to love your neighbor as yourself. But in terms of race, it's important to recognize that... Our neighbor, whatever the color of their skin, is created in God's image and is worthy of dignity and respect. And that's an always learning. And then um, one sentence I just want to share with you that we talked a bit about this morning, and I think that this applies more to more than racism, but... The author's right. For human beings doing the right thing, for human beings doing the right thing, it is really all about cooperation. And I think that's another way of saying love one another. <laughs> this is how to stop racism and why racism must stop. It's about human survival. If we all don't win, we lose. How we live together as human beings created in God's image is also about how we survive as human beings. I think that's a really important sentence, maybe one of the biggest takeaways from this. But it's more than race. It's about seeing the dignity in everyone. So we mentioned when I said you can stand or not. The invitation's to you. 
the Senate Assembly this week was, the theme was about the body of Christ, caring for the body of Christ. And there was um, Bible study, and then uh, the Bible study was led by a pastor who, um, it's like around the time COVID got here, he got an autoimmune disease where his body attacks the, 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 um, the, the, yeah, the thing that covers your nerves, my life. And so if you can imagine having your nerves attacked by your own body or, and he, and so his whole Bible study, it was a series of conversations, was helping us to recognize disability and, and him sharing with us, not recognizing disability, but recognizing the human dignity of people who have disabilities. And his sharing with us that when he, for a while he was in a wheelchair because his, his, he lost the use of his legs because of the nerves, and he's actually gotten a little bit better so he can walk with a cane, but he said when he was in a wheelchair, he experienced that people did not see him as a strong white man or pastor. All they saw him as disabled, not a man in a wheelchair, not a pastor in a wheelchair. The keynote speaker is a bishop in um, Wisconsin, Michigan. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I, I always get the gist of it. <laughs> and he was born blind. And he, and I've heard him speak before, so I may have mentioned him before to you, because he was a keynote speaker at one of the events I was at. When he was born, his parents, his parents were told, don't get life insurance for him because he's just going to run out into the street and get hit by a car. Um, and maybe he can get a job, you know, doing some menial labor, but definitely not going to be a bishop someday. But he talks about how even in the ELCA, he's been a bishop for 10 years, and he has, he keeps telling them that this is not accessible to me, this, and, they, and we don't change. We never fix it. But it's a reminder to us that to be disciples and to be learning as disciples how to love our neighbor means we need to learn to see our neighbor First, as a human being, somebody precious, created in God's image, and not to see our neighbor as whatever it is that has caused that person to be disabled. It sounds easy, but it's not. But there's an invitation for us as a community of believers to lean into that and to grow, to be disciples. And as we learn and grow, to teach others. And then my last example, again, is I feel like I've been here long enough now, I keep saying I've told you this story, so <laughs> remember it. But um, when I was in the LCMS, and discerning that God was calling me into ministry, I obviously could not stay in the LCMS because they refused to ordain women. Although there were some pastors who, who wanted me to stay and try and work for change, but I didn't feel like God was calling me to go and bang my head against a wall. But one of the arguments while I was there, and it might still be an argument, I don't know, I don't really delve much into LCMS matters anymore, but one of the arguments against female ordination, do you remember I shared with you, what was the biggest argument against female ordination? Anyone remember? If we ordain women, then the gays are next. And that really offended me as a woman. Because I was like, well, why should my future and my call be dictated based on people who are gay? They didn't say lesbians. 
because, you know, lesbians are women. But anyway. And so I, was, I, was, I think I was pretty agnostic in terms of, of openness to people in the LGBTQ community. But then I began learning. God, you know, has this way of teaching you. And came to understand that what they were saying in the LCMS as an argument against women using gay people as scapegoats, really, against the ordination of women, they were actually right. Not because it's a bad thing, though. They were right because it's what should have been done. So today in the ELCA, gays and lesbians and transgendered and queer folks, they can be ordained. And that, my friends, is a very good thing. And it's, a, and it's an example I think some of us could hold on to where God has taught us to see things in a different way, to recognize people first as human beings who are precious and created in God's image, and not as society might want to define them. We all have places where we can learn better to love our neighbors. I certainly do. And if we're honest with ourselves, we probably can pinpoint times in our lives when we were challenged enough that we had to change how we see our neighbor. That's a way of experiencing God's grace. To be disciples is to be ever learning. To always be about figuring out how to see our world in a way that grants dignity and respect and love to all people. But it's not always easy, is it? We look at the world around us and we've become, as a nation, so polarized over these issues that I just talked about. Which takes me back in a circle. Say life, uh, is, is, it's faith, life is circular. And for me, <laughs> where I identify with that the, the beginning of this, before Jesus gave the Great Commission, identify with the disciples worshiping Jesus, but some had their doubts. I, can, I doubt, my doubt, is in our, not our congregation, but included within that, but our as a human species, our inability to move beyond our certainty and move into love of neighbor. But what do I do with that doubt? Just what Jesus did with his disciples. I take on the work of the Great Commission by being a disciple and working to make more disciples. And that's not just for pastors, but it's for you too. It's for all of us as a community, a community that is loved unconditionally by the God we know as father or creator, son, redeemer, and Holy Spirit, wisdom.
that call is for all of us. But when we, and also when we doubt, or when we feel like it's just too much, we remember those other words of Jesus. He said, remember that I am with you always, even, especially, to the end. Amen. We're going to be singing a new song from All Creation Sings called Womb of Life and Source of Being. Okay, Tim's going to play the melody through. As we prepare for prayers this morning, I invite you to refer to the prayers that are in the grace notes.
Um, and other prayer concerns? Robin? Okay, prayers for our congregational meeting. Donna? Okay, so Donna's sister, Tony. Hospital, maybe heart attack, maybe stroke. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. I don't so, either. Um, yeah. All right. So to summarize all that for people who are on Zoom who can't hear you, um, prayers for the the LGBTQ community, especially because of so much hateful and um, dehumanizing legislation that is being either passed or presented um, throughout our country. And um, it's not enough to say, well, we live in California. That's not enough because we're a nation that um, sometimes what happens in Georgia or Texas or Florida affects us here in California. And so thank you for lifting up that prayer. I will add prayer that um, today is the start of the AIDS life cycle. And... Um, it's an awesome experience where people who are gay or lesbian or transgender queer get to enter what they call the love bubble, where for one week they don't have to hear any of that stuff, but get to be supportive of one another while at the same time pushing their bodies to the limit whether it's a cyclist or as a volunteer. Because the volunteers, I think, are working as hard as the cyclists. They're just not on a bike. So keep that ride in your prayers. And Friday, if you have time, go to Ventura and cheer them as they come in. Or Saturday morning, go out on Harbor and cheer them as they go out. Prayer concerns online? Eileen. Hi, Eileen. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I would like to ask for prayer for a former member, Len Hunter. For those of you who remember him and Renee, he has been diagnosed with cancer in one eye mm. and uh, feeling pretty discouraged right now. So I would ask you to pray for him and for Renee. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Let us pray. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers as disciples who are continuing to learn. Let us offer our prayers for a world in need. Holy Three, Holy One, you call the church to make disciples of all nations. 
Encourage bishops, pastors, deacons, and all who are members of your body. Encourage them in their own proclamation of the gospel and encourage us all to live lives of humble service in love of neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Three, Holy One, you spoke creation into being and you called it good. Protect lands and waters threatened by human misuse and, stay, and sustain living creatures of every kind, wild animals, birds, fish, and every creeping thing. And help us to remember that you created us, you created this world. And help us to always be thankful for that grace. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> holy Three, Holy One. In that creation story, you gave humankind authority over all the earth. Sometimes we squander that authority. Help us to use what you've given us in care and love of neighbor. Raise up leaders in our cities, our states, our nations. Raise up leaders who listen earnestly, speak honestly, and govern thoughtfully. We pray for healing of divisions between nations, that we might agree with one another, and that rather than war, we experience peace. Lord, in your mercy, Holy Three, Holy One, you promise to be with us always to the end of the age. Surround those most in need of your healing presence, any and all who are lonely, all who are grieving, and those who are suffering from illnesses, especially those we have mentioned before you and those whose names we continue to hold in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, Holy Three, Holy One, you set the earth on its axis and we experience the seasons. Strengthen those enduring challenges this summer, those who suffer in the heat, parents overwhelmed by childcare responsibility, and children who experience food insecurity outside of school. And as our children and our preschool graduate this week, we pray that they leave this place not only prepared for either kindergarten or first grade, but they leave this place knowing that you love them unconditionally. And may we continue to teach that in our school. Lord, in your mercy, Holy Three, Holy One, you give rest when our work is done. We give thanks for all the saints who now rest in you, confident in the promise of resurrection life in the age to come. God, in your mercy, receive our prayers and answer us, O God, in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. And the peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share that with one another as you feel able.
Let us pray. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. You reveal your glory as the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, equal in majesty, undivided in splendor, one Lord, one God, ever to be adored in your eternal glory. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. He was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks for it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take any, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, Jesus, Jesus took the cup, he gave thanks for it, and he gave it to all to drink, saying, This is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And gathered together as Jesus' disciples, let us pray as Jesus taught us. We will be saying the Lord's Prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Will you join in singing, Be Known to Us, Lord Jesus? And when we serve communion, we'll come down and serve in front of the steps. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Yes, I did not say to stand. I'm trying to figure out how's the best way to do all that, which I, it's not the first time I've ever thought about that. So <laughs> um, let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world. To the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, 
Amen. And please be seated for a few announcements. Good morning, everyone. Just a reminder that our special congregational meeting is following worship. I do know that Bruce put out the Keurig, so we might have a little coffee before we start. Always makes for good decisions. <laughs> um, anyway, Monday we'll be stretching prayer at 5 p.m. And on Wednesday at 9 a.m., the quilting group will meet in the coffee shop. And Wednesdays at noon is word and prayer, both in person and online. Uh, Linda Leffler informed me that 328 pairs of underwear were collected along with 16 t-shirts. So good job, everybody. Um, community action does need men's clothing. So if you have some gently used clothing, uh, they would appreciate it. I'm sure you could arrange that to get it over there through Linda. Um, also, we're collecting women's underwear this month. Um, as you can see, we already have some available. Uh, please feel free to stop by and drop it off either in the church office or put it up here on the altar. Um, I guess that's it, Pastor. I don't think I have anything else. Um, Saturday is worship. Oh, yeah. Saturday we have worship. We have no menu yet. So if anybody has any ideas or would like to contribute, please see Karen and I after worship. So we did, huh? Who's? Brenda. Eileen and Brenda. Is Eileen? And Shirley Godwin. Is Eileen still there? We sang happy birthday to you last week, Eileen, and we will sing again. And happy birthday, Brenda, and happy birthday, Shirley. So we should have had a big birthday cake, huh? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Blessings to you, Eileen and Brenda, on your birthdays as you continue to be a blessing to all of us and everyone around you. Okay, if you'd like, you can stand for one last time before we come sit down for our congregational meeting. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. And we sing, Heaven is Singing for Joy.
activist.